so today um, we are going to be talking about investment policy statements and why, why they are important. Um, and as we get underway with this, and uh, for those of you who are less familiar, the foundation is just over 20 years old. We were established by the General Counsel Executive in 2002 uh, uh, with the purpose of providing su support and services to the entire church. Um, and we, have, uh, we are aligned with the General Counsel's strategic plan um, but we have our unique spin on the uh, spin, unique place, I would say better, in, in um, the work of fostering deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. For the foundation, um, we're really focusing on those pieces in attracting and deploying financial resources. Um, so we do focus on the future long-term sustainability. Um, and part of that work is um, in helping congregations, communities of faith, and uh, United Church folks in their school, um, theological education, professional development around um, projects, interesting opportunities that come up. So you can see here um, some details on our granting program. Seeds of Hope is the big one. The spring cycle has just closed, but there'll be a cycle this fall. So uh, please do check our website and reach out with questions and, and ideas. We love, love to hear from you. Uh, there, is, there are some scholarships and some academic awards and some uh, for, for professional development as well that we do offer, usually in the spring. Um, and then we also make connections to other programs that we're aware of in the church that support things like innovative ministries or capital assistance um, uh, or the uh, indi indigenous, uh, indigenous ministries and justice. Um, so again, yeah, check our website and we're always happy to answer questions, have conversations about the grants and what opportunities there are. Our grants are made possible through uh, the generosity of United Church folks and organizations from across this country. We have uh, a number of, well, several, uh, several hundred funds um, that we manage that have been set up for long-term sustainable, sustainable support. A number of those are used in the granting programs and others have very specific purposes like supporting mission and service or a particular congregation. Um, so you'll see overall, we have uh, just over 90 million uh, in that has been gifted and entrusted to us. And so it's really uh, a responsibility that the foundation takes very seriously in terms of how we honor stewardship and manage um, those funds. And part of what we're looking at is if every year we grant somewhere in the range of about 6% of our overall asset base, which is more than CRA uh, mandates, but we feel uh, overall gives us um, the ability to make meaningful grants that support the work of the church and um, grow the funds so that in times of returns that aren't so great like last year, there's a bit of a cushion there um, so that they're growing over the long term. You'll see our long term rates are actually quite good. Um, and uh, we do have uh, three uh, fund managers or investment managers that we work with in particular, Genesis Capital, Canoe Financial, also known as Frontier Financial, uh, and Fiera Capital. Fiera manages the bulk of the foundation's investments. You'll see that uh, 80, 86 million or so now. Um, and Genis has 5 million that we've carved out as impact investments because while we're giving out on average about 6% of our assets, um, or the equivalent of, I should say, the 6% of our assets, that leaves 94% that's invested. And we want to be sure that those pieces are doing good work. And so um, we have made a particular portion of those uh, investments really attentive to gaining a financial return as well as an environmental or social return of, of some sort. And so we wanna make sure that 
all of the money that's been entrusted to us is doing good work now through grants and into the future through future grants as well as uh, the results of the investments. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we've received the monies that we have through the generosity of um, United Church folk and um, some of it comes through short-term giving, which tends to be gifts of stocks and mutual funds. Um, most often, that money goes right back out to a congregation, which is wonderful. Um, it's somewhere between four and six million dollars uh, a year in, in that kind of giving, uh, depending on the uh, economic and investment environment. Um, and then we have the long-term giving that makes up the, those, that 90 to uh, or so million that we have right now. Some are endowments, which we hold forever, and it's only the uh, a portion of the income that gets granted out. Some are trusts, which are meant to be spent down over time, and sometimes folks make gifts in their will or through life insurance. That so that's sort of how we've come to have all all the the wonderful gifts that we've received. And I am sure that your experience in your congregation and community of faith are similar. You've, you've seen all those, those things. Um, so when we come to thinking more about um, those assets, those gifts that we've been entrusted with for the long term, having an investment policy is really critical. It means that you have a plan for how and when that money is gonna be used. It means that you've taken into consideration uh, these five things that are up on the screen. Um, and it, it is sort of that guiding uh, star that will help you ensure that you're, you are stewarding those gifts really, really well. So we're gonna talk about each of these these five uh, aspects of the IPS investment policy statement. Um, when you work with a uh, investment manager to, you know, develop or finalize or put, you know, the finishing touches on a policy, um, they may have a, a couple of other things they'd like you to consider. But these, I think, really are what you need um, at the base level. And I should say. <laughs> that I'm not an investment professional. My training is not at all uh, in finance. However, I've been supporting the foundation's uh, investment committee for the 15, 16, maybe 17 years now. And um, I have, uh, so I've learned from them and from the process that we've gone through to uh, review and revise our policy from time to time. Uh, and I spend some of my time um, at um, conferences or other meetings talking about investments and, and the components of uh, investment policies. So um, I'm coming at this from, from a financial layperson uh, perspective. Um, and what I say here, of course, you, you'll need to take back to your folks and uh, to your expert advisors who will be able to help you hone in on the, the correct parameters for, for, for your situation. Um, oh, this is the wrong version of the <laughs> PowerPoint. <laughs> so we'll get you the right version, but I won't stop to, to change it now. Um, the, um, what I was gonna say about risk is there are many elements to this. There's the risk we're willing to take in our own investments. Um, and that may be very different. In fact, it often is very different from the risk we're willing to take with assets that we oversee for a, an organization. Um, and so we need to be careful to balance what we're comfortable with, what the organization's comfortable with, and what we think um, is, is appropriate for what, for what we wanna do. Um, and so, there can be a number of things to consider uh, in terms of the risk. And often the first thing people think of is how much are we willing to lose? And sometimes the answer is nothing. <laughs> and that's fine. That's the answer for you. Um, the foundation, we consider ourselves to have a um, sort of medium risk tolerance, uh, which means that you know, we're willing to ride out 
some of the ups and downs of the stock market. We're not going to take um, excessive risk. We're not going to focus only on growth and you know venture capital and all those things that could have really big payoffs, but could also have really big downsides. So the foundation has settled in kind of medium, which means that we do have a mix of um, fixed income or fixed income like um, investments like bonds, for example. We do have um, a significant portion of our a portfolio in equities, which is uh, like stocks. Um, and uh, there is some, there's more now than there used to be because of our current climate in cash and short-term investments. We've also added what people often call alternatives or real assets. Um, for a long time, we didn't have those. And uh, that worked well for us and that was fine. Um, but when you look around at what other foundations, what other charitable organizations, in our case, looking at our sort of peer group, were doing, a lot of them were adding in this other category because it um, it it works differently. It has different characteristics um, compared to fixed income or equity. So it adds a level of diversity to the portfolio um, and it doesn't respond to market ups and downs in the same way. So it's the idea is that hopefully it's adding a bit of a cushion. The thing about that is that it can often be a little bit more opaque um, in terms of how things are valued, <clears throat> how things are, um, mainly how they're valued, I would say, uh, and often the expenses associated with it. So that's another piece of the risk is understanding those different elements in your portfolio and are you comfortable? Do you have a manager who's able to answer your questions around those pieces to ensure you have comfort um, to include things like that in your portfolio? I don't think I said this at the beginning, but if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat and we will we'll get to them at the end. So I'll just, I'll go through and then we'll have some time for, for discussion at the end. Um, my points under time horizons um, are that there is a variety. And as a congregation or another community of faith, you have short-term, medium, and long-term needs. Short, you know, your short-term are, of course, your sort of day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month pieces. You might have some uh, from time to time or more consistently, you might have some, some things that are more of a medium time horizon that could be multi-year projects, um, either you know, program projects or um, uh, building projects, for example. My own congregation at the moment is going through uh, replacing our roof. <laughs> I'm sure that's not a new story for many of you either. Uh, and so you know, part of, part of the discussion there is around um, how we organize our uh, assets to ensure that we've got day-to-day, -day, sort of that longer term um, where future cash will need cash to pay for certain things. And then of course you have your long-term ho time horizon, um, which for the foundation I describe is 10 years plus. And so that's really looking farther into the future um, about what your income needs are going to be, about the kinds of things you dream your congregation community of faith might be doing at that point. Um, and for each of those time horizons, your short, medium, and long term, you're going to need different strategies. You can't lock up something in a GIC or a bond that you can't sell that's going to be locked up for five years if you're going to need that cash within a year, for example. So you, you need to consider in your portfolio how you're going to divide those needs up and how you're going to address them. And so uh, when it comes to writing this and the piece about risk into your um, investment policy statement, uh, you'll just wanna be clear. Clear about, you know, in terms of the risk, this is the risk we are comfortable with. We would be comfortable with um, uh, not losing any money. We would be comfortable with a potential downside of 5% or uh, something like that. And then in your time horizon, um, you would include uh, pieces um, 
like we know that we will need on an ongoing basis x percent of our assets for short-term needs you know another however much for your medium needs and however much for your long-term needs and that will help um, your advisors your experts um, figure out what the best mix of holdings in your portfolio will be um, and then I'm going to skip because related to that exactly are your income needs. So because the foundation is primarily focused on the long term, we say that our what we're looking for is um, an overall return of between five and eight percent on average per year. Our uh, investment managers have been really good at helping us achieve that. Um, and we are able to set that because what we, we know that we're gonna need about um, five to 6% a year uh, in income to fulfill our grants. And so um, when it comes again on that short, medium, long-term, what, what are your income needs? Are you going to need um, X dollars in cash per month, per year? Are you going to need um, over the long term, you want to realize that 5% or that 6%, what have you. So this, this is the part where um, that also helps just determine how uh, that, that the diversity of the holdings in your portfolio to ensure that you have some that will give you the, the cash you need on a regular basis and some that will uh, provide for future um, future payouts or ability to, to um, withdraw funds. And then um, the, the last of the, of the five is about um, what's often called ESG or, or your values, um, which aren't quite the same thing. So ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance. For me, um, the any manager that I would consider for for my own investments, for the foundation's investments, has to have an ESG lens or process embedded in their um, in the way they do their work. Because what it um, I won't say it guarantees, but what it helps is ensuring that the holdings, the actual companies that are in your portfolio are um, doing uh, good or what's often called best in class work in, in those three areas and environmental uh, impact of their work in their social uh, impact, which is often around um, how they treat the communities they operate in, how they treat their workers, um, and um, are they generally good corporate citizens? Uh, and then the governance is around how they run their organization. Do they have um, diverse board management? Do they have solid um, practices and evaluations? Are they transparent in their operations? All those kinds of things um, goes into uh, ESG screening and um, helps weed out bad actors or companies that, frankly, the research shows aren't going to do as well over time. Companies that um, have really solid foundations <clears throat> in the ESG space tend to do better over the long term than those that don't. So that's, that's also another reason that I think it's really important for an investment manager uh, to consider uh, to consider those factors. Values, I think, are a layer on top of that. And um, each, each congregation is unique in what they really value, what's most important to them. I think most of us have a recognition that care for creation or you know, work on the climate change issue is important, that uh, work on anti-racism is important, that reconciliation and indigenous justice is important. Um, and then, you know, there are other concerns that folks have as well that play into what they may or may not want to invest in. And so um, what 
so I think it's, there has to be a conversation within the community of faith or the congregation <clears throat> to really talk about, are there things that we absolutely must have in our portfolio? Are there absolutely things that we wouldn't want to have in our portfolio? So that goes towards screening, which is sort of um, a baseline or, or basic way to approach um, responsible uh, investing, for example. There are some folks who will say, I just want returns. <laughs> like, I just need to make sure that we are getting X dollars or X percent because I know what the, the costs are and that is what is most important to me. And that's, that's definitely a perspective. Um, for folks who want to um, more align their investments or their assets with their values, then having that conversation about, you know, what's really important to us and starting from that screening perspective um, is, a, is a really good way to begin. Um, often um, um, folks think, uh, let's just, you know, we'll have a zero tolerance, we'll screen everything out. Um, and that's okay, but then that takes, that makes your investment universe fairly small. Um, we have a, what we would call a materiality threshold. So um, more often than not, those things are set at, at 10%. So a company cannot make 10 more than 10% of its revenue from selling tobacco, for instance. So uh, that may or may not weed out things like um, large convenience store chains, for example, um, as places that, that do sell tobacco, for example. So um, there's that positive negative screen. We do want this. We absolutely don't want this, or we don't want more than three, five, 10% of revenue to be generated from that. Um, and then there is the impact investing that I talked about earlier. Um, how do we actually source investments that will do good with the money they're holding uh, while we make grants from, from the, uh, the capital or the principal. Um, and um, there's, no, like, there's no right answers for this. It's, it's what um, works for your congregation, your community of faith, um, and whether or not you want to incorporate values and then which which ones. Uh, when we send out the follow-up, I'll have some links to various sites that will that have some screening tools, that have some thought pieces that might help uh, with some of those, those discussions. Um, the other thing I would say around this is that the church has been a leader um, in a number of cases on shareholder engagement. So actually going to companies that we hold, um, stocks or, or other uh, uh, investments in and talking with them about the practices that we want them to change. So, and I think that's a really important tool um, because it often, um, it does more than just divesting from a particular industry or, um, or company um, because uh, somebody else is gonna, <laughs> It's, it's a common argument, but somebody else is going to buy those shares and then you've lost the opportunity to actually have the influence to encourage them to make a change. So, um, so from my perspective, shareholder engagement is really important. Now, the foundation has most of our um, investments in pooled funds. So we don't actually hold individual securities. We hold units in a fund. So to do shareholder engagement, we have to influence our investment manager to be the one to influence the, um, the company where we want the change. Um, and that actually works because when we influence our fund manager, they represent a large number of investors with a lot of assets. So they have way more influence uh, than we do as a foundation, for example. And so even if you're investing uh, in mutual funds or pooled funds or something like that, having a conversation with your, whoever looks over your, your um, investments is, is really valuable. And um, there are a number, we have a post that will put the, 
the a post on the website that we'll put the link in the follow up resources for for questions that you can ask. Um, you know, and it's things like, is the is the board diverse? Is management diverse? I said those ones earlier, but you know, what are your practices? Um, what's your carbon footprint? What are you doing to mitigate that? Um, you know, questions like that 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 you can ask either um, the company that you're investing in or your investment manager to help generate some of that change, some of the conversations around things that need to happen. Um, and so just, you know, as an example, the foundation earlier this spring signed a letter to Fiera that holds the bulk of our assets. They also hold some of the United Church treasury monies and some of the United Church pension funds. So all three organizations signed a letter that said, we'd like you to take a look at how you're voting proxies on your environmental piece, on your workers' rights piece, um, and uh, on the reconciliation, how you're, how you're responding to the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. So the three of us signed, as did, I think 15, 16 maybe, other organizations. And then we all got together and had a great conversation with Fiera, learned some things that we didn't know that they were doing. And, um, and they've agreed to you know, take a look at uh, some of the questions we've posed and, and dive a little bit deeper on that. So I think, you know, that's a really important piece of, um, of, of our investing. And we've incorporated in our, in the foundation's uh, investment policy statement, we've incorporated um, language that uh, acknowledges that we would do these things, that we would engage, um, that we would look at uh, impact investing. Um, that we have particular values that we want our investment managers to pay attention with. Now, I was actually at an investment conference last week where um, one of the large investment managers was advocating for, for organizations to have a separate policy around their, their values and so to not mesh the two. Um, my, <laughs> I, at one point, I had three policies that related to our investments and trying to keep track of them all and trying to keep them all together um, and trying to make sure the committee was aware and the board and it just got to be a lot. So we have combined our two. Um, I'd be happy to hear other folks experience uh, on that or thoughts on that. But um, all that's to say is for ease of use and simplicity, we've written our values uh, into, our, um, into our policy. Uh, and um, and that, yeah, it's on. It's under its own section heading, and it is quite narrative, as opposed to some of the other ones that have, you know, more numbers and, and things like that in them. Um, the one thing that I haven't met mentioned here is about um, whether or not you are uh, engaging an investment manager of some sort, or whether or not you're doing the investing yourself. So that is also a really important piece to put into your investment policy statement. Do you expect that uh, your trustees or some other body is going to actually pick the stock? Or are you going to delegate that responsibility to an investment manager of some sort? Um, so important to make those two distinctions. And then if you are delegating, uh, important to say the kinds of things that you'll look for or evaluate your manager on. So um, usually performance is one of the points of uh, evaluation. Did they um, meet or exceed the benchmarks they set? Are they meeting your target uh, returns? Are they responsive to your questions? Uh, are you getting good service? Those are the kinds of things that you might evaluate a manager on and you, you could write that into uh, the investment policy. Um, and I think we did income needs already there. That was my evaluation slide. There we are. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's including who is responsible and how you will evaluate them. Um, also to include what, uh, how often you're going to do that. Um, it was noted at the conference last week, the more often you switch managers, the worse your performance is over time. So uh, a caution that probably evaluating every year is not the way to go, but you know, three to five. Um, 
might might be a reasonable time horizon for that. We, I believe, have it written in at five. Um, we do meet with the investment managers quarterly, so that might also be uh, something to consider um, in terms of of what um, your expectations of somebody else who's managing for you, um, whether or not they would come to you four times a year or twice a year or what, whatever that schedule would best be. Uh, and I think um, that's a lot of talking. <laughs> and so um, I can see that there are some uh, questions in the chat. So why don't I uh, stop sharing? And, uh, and we'll take a look at that. Um, so uh, there's a question about our sample policy statements available. Yes, um, there is a link. I don't know if it's already in the chat to, um, to our website where there are, we have a page on how to develop an investment policy. And so there are some links there that will be helpful. Um, all right, and so there's a, a, a question or a comment perhaps about um, the impact of investing in anything with fossil fuels and trying to get congregations to divest. The general council uh, directed the treasury fund to divest back in 2015 or 2018. Um, so that was, definitely a decision um, that they took. And um, it, one of the questions around that then is how far are you gonna, and, and, and I, I mean, no judgment by this, it's just, it's, it is the question, how far are you going to go with that? All right, so then um, are you excluding pipelines? Are you excluding transport? Are you like, how granular are you gonna be about that? And I suspect that maybe, um, that may be different for different places, different congregations, but that that is part of the, the conversation. Is it that zero tolerance or is there some level of tolerance? Um, and um, there's a question about equity, our, our, our allocation. So um, yeah, so the alternatives that we've included um, we're considering it sort of a learning uh, curve. And so um, fairly small allocation of 15% total in more or less three categories. So real estate, infrastructure, and um, agriculture. And wanting to ensure that once, once we've done that and we can see what we're actually invested in, um, that the real estate is managed in a way that is um, as environmentally sustainable as possible. Uh, same deal with the farms that we're not, it's not uh, buying out all the small farmers. So there's no small farms anywhere, et cetera. So there's that piece. <laughs> That's more than you asked about that. <laughs> That's that piece. Um, equity makes up, um, now that we've moved it, I believe 45 percent of our 45 to 60 percent of our um, allocation. The uh, cash and short-term investments is more like 15 to 20 right now. Um, and then the fixed income is uh, that leaves somewhere between 20 and 20 and 30 percent. Um, so there's a little bit of we get we've given our manager a little bit of leeway right now. Um, to make some more tactical decisions because of the um, just because of inflation and the impact it's had on markets, um, but that is a move away from our more or less 60-40. That it's a fairly traditional, relatively conservative um, um, mix. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, I, I'm not sure if what I just said uh, answers the question about what mix of equities versus fixed income would be a, would be a medium risk. So when we had that 60-40 split, that was medium, um, and it was um, 
uh, like mostly Canadian, but then um, about 15% US and 15% international. So kind of splitting those ones as well. Um, in terms of being a, a charity or additional things you would need to consider so because simply because we all are all are charitable organizations. Um, for me, clarity, because um, somebody is going to ask you, what do you mean by this? Like, what are you doing with your invested assets? How are you, how are you um, holding them? How are they being managed? And so I think being as simple and plain and using the least amount of jargon possible in your investment policy um, goes a long way to helping you answer those questions and to being sure that whoever, um, um, whoever's looking after your, uh, your investments also understands exactly um, what they should be doing, right? Um, but there's nothing in particular, um, there's nothing special that charities have to do. Um, there is a perception, and I think there, like, that comes from historical truth, that um, congregations and communities of faith can't take on any kind of risk. Um, so, but that's not that's not the case. But you have to be prudent. You have to be a prudent investor. You have to take decisions that uh, somebody with a reasonable understanding of things would take. So, you know. Like I said, not investing in venture capital or super risky um, uh, opportunities like that, that wouldn't be on board with that prudent um, investor piece. But it doesn't mean that you only invest in fixed income or GICs or something like that. Yeah. Um, um, we'll send around the foundation's uh, investment policy um, because while to, to the point in the chat that we are invested in pooled funds. Yes, we, we have to make sure those funds align and they do report to us on um, how well they're meeting our, our value criteria. Um, and they, can, they will only choose uh, or recommend funds for us that fit within our, um, our investment policy statement. So um, we aren't... Uh, we aren't a single pooled fund anymore as we were in the past. We've broken it up into a number of different ones. So we have a little more control that way, but still, yeah, it's it's about fit in that case and, and having a good relationship with the manager to understand what is a good fit for our policy and their funds versus um, what is not. Yeah. Um, another, um, question I often get is um, one about, do we actually need one? Like we've been doing this for a really long time and the trustees know what they're doing and um, et cetera, et cetera. And my answer is yes, you really do because the people managing today are not gonna be people managing in five, 10, 15 years. I mean, trustees do have a long, often in congregational life, they do have a long uh, tenure. Um, but we can't, I think, anymore rely on that fact that the same people are going to be there being able to manage um, as, as um, proficiently as they were given all the, all the things that are happening in the world today. And so um, having a policy ensures that you're transferring knowledge well um, and that you're, everybody is aligned um, with the same goals for your investments and you're not drifting off um, potentially for shiny new things or um, in a lot of cases being too risk averse. Um, but again, it's it's a question for what what the congregation and what, what the folks overseeing are truly comfortable with. Um, so yeah, um, a mute, so not being a, uh, not being an investment professional, I'm going to do my best with the difference between pool and mutual fund. So mutual fund is um, 
what we think of as retail investors. So it's usually meant, it's like it's the stuff you could buy through your own um, self-serve investment account or that your person at the bank is offering you, whereas pooled funds are usually for larger investors and they have a, a slightly different structure, a slightly different fee structure, um, different, slightly different regulations to them. Similar, similar in that it's a basket of securities, um, but different in, in other technical ways that I can't really <laughs> go into detail on. Um, we talked about another frequent question is how often should we update? We've talked about that. Um, and I think like I would just say again to the, the clarity piece, it's not that your investment policy statement needs to be complicated. It can be really straightforward. Um, and yes, some of the ones, some of the examples we have are for large organizations, but we'll include the foundations, um, which we've greatly simplified uh, over the years. So hopefully will be, will be helpful. Um, but I think um, I'm always happy. We're always happy to hear from you and to have conversations about this. So the contact um, information will come again in the follow-up uh, email. Um, and, and you can always check out our website um, for, for information in the meantime. Um, Right, so, so reach out if you have further questions, if, if something comes to you later today, tomorrow, over the weekend, um, or if the foundation can be of help either uh, in managing investments um, or referring you to one of our uh, affiliate, uh, affiliate managers. Um, so thank you all so very much for joining today. Really appreciated my time with you and uh, wish you a pleasant rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.